Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Young and Foolish podcast. Today, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. So guys, we've all lived in Canada for most of our lives. So I want to ask you guys, what do you think are the biggest problems in Canada? Anyone? Man, that's a good question. What do you think, Raymond? What do you think? I don't know, man. Um... I mean, yeah. uh, recently, like in more recent years, you really start to see how poorly the indigenous community has been treated, you know? There's been a lot more attention on that recently, and I never knew how bad it was, you know? Like, I knew the residences were, uh, yeah, were really bad. Residential Yeah, the residential, schools. well, obviously, yeah, the residential yeah. schools, but even, um, yeah. we're, 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 what are the communities that they live in called sometimes? Are they not? Reservations. Yeah, reservations, yeah, that was yeah. the word, Yeah. yeah. Um, just seeing how they've been kind of neglected and like all the problems they have in those areas, you know, it's kind of crazy. So that's a pretty big issue, I think. Um, yeah, definitely sure. one of the bigger social I mean, issues for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, we definitely learn about some of that even at school, which I think it's cool. yeah, and we're definitely definitely hearing a lot more about it and like on the news and just social media and all mm-hmm. that just kind of spreading awareness of the issue and it does feel like that people are taking it more seriously are realizing it and there's definitely a lot more people who are trying to do something about it and uh, yeah so I, I do agree with you that is like a big problem especially socially but um for me i i don't really see it as like one of the biggest problems just because it doesn't affect as many people mm-hmm. i think um but definitely something interesting to talk about and something that we should be raising the awareness and trying to solve because I think it's a problem that we can definitely solve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think a big part of it is just bringing attention to it because I know for the last few years, it, it's been up and coming like with more evidence to show that they're not being treated um as appropriately as you know as others and um especially just helping out with the community i think they lack a lot of aid um but yeah i think uh another big issue about canada is how the government runs um a lot of the places and and how the government deals with issues uh an example being the pandemic I think the government's been handling okay. it not like super poorly, but I feel like there could have been a lot of improvement and a lot of, mm-hmm. I guess, things they could have done more efficiently rather than prolonging it for this, yeah. like for basically two years. And um, I think that's a really big issue because you, like majority of people believe in the government when it comes to... Um, these you know countrywide issues i feel like the government's yeah. been letting a lot of people down um and there's always room to improve and there's mm-hmm. always better ways to to do things um and i feel like they're just not they, they didn't really plan out as well as they thought or like as we thought they would yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. especially compared to other countries too like new zealand and like um, China, Taiwan, like they they've all, you know, had minimal cases of like one to three in the past almost year. And I feel like Canada and the States or mainly just the Western countries are too lenient on um the public and they let the public have a lot more power than they should. Um that being said, um yeah, I think they need to take more responsibility when it comes to these, you know, large issues. Yeah. yeah. I think um, what you're saying actually really ties into what I think is the biggest problem in Canada, uh, which is complacency. I feel like um, a lot of people, so basically the society and also the government, so on both fronts, it just feel like people are kind of feeling, feeling like it's pretty good things are pretty good we're dealing with things pretty well like overall like 
you know, but like you're saying, there's always room for improvement, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of times, I feel like the default comparison we make is to the United States. Mm-hmm. And when we look at a lot of issues, we're like, okay, things are pretty good in Canada, man. Then you hear all the news about the Americans want to come to Canada, and they all think it's all great. And you know what? Uh, to a certain to, to a certain extent, that is true. Canada, you know, is pretty yeah. good. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of things that we can do better. Mm-hmm. Like you're saying with COVID, you compared it to like New Zealand and like Taiwan or whatnot, right? Other countries who really dealt with the problem very efficiently and really, really well overall. Mm-hmm. And I think basically that same idea, but with other issues, like a huge problem in the United States is the uh, student loans, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The student debt issue the high tuition issue right in canada a lot of people like look at it and they think oh wow uh (laughs) it's not that bad tuition is not that expensive that the student loan you get Mm -hmm. the debt you accumulate it's more manageable Mm -hmm. and you know what like they are literally americans who come to canada and pay what like international students pay and it's still cheaper Mm -hmm. so like canada is doing much better right Mm -hmm. yeah it is it is insane so yeah, Canada is doing much better. But then you look at it, you're like, okay, what if we stop comparing to the United States and take a look at what else is happening around the world? Mm-hmm. And you look at countries uh, where tuition is much cheaper. You look at countries where tuition is free, mm-hmm. right? So like, you look at Germany, for example. Not only are public universities free, they are free for international students. We could all go there right now, get free <laughs> tuition. Right, you gotta pay administration fee, and that's mm-hmm. about it, right? And then you look at like some of the Nordic countries, where they pay you monthly to cover your living expenses. I've heard about that as you're going through university, that's crazy. right? Right. So people hear about these like really, you know, really great policies that other countries have, and then when they look at Canada, all of a sudden it doesn't seem to be as good, mm-hmm. right? So I feel like. A lot of the times we're just very complacent about how things are. It's like, oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And we don't really push for mm-hmm. things to be better yeah. and look for the improvement, as Raymond was saying. I, um, I definitely agree with you, George. I think a lot of the times I feel like people are they're too comfortable in like how they're living. So they don't really take account on all the issues that we really have. Um, and no one really makes a movement for it or um, really, like, brings it up to attention. Um, especially, yeah, like you were saying, like, student loans. Um, I'm just glad people are realizing it now. And I feel like we could do a lot better as a country uh, to help out, you know, the up-and-coming generations. Um, yeah, I think it would be really beneficial. Uh, and I feel like a lot of times, like, it, it helps individuals like um more than people would like or well more than people would think because without that debt without you know that uh all you know like i have to pay a certain amount by this time and um in the back of your mind you you can focus on studying and you can focus Mm -hmm. on you know your education a lot more rather than oh i have to do it you know it's not i want to do it it's kind of demanding so that puts a lot more like you know that that puts more stress on people and more pressure for students to do well and i feel like that's um one of the biggest main you know factors for people dropping out um people not choosing to go into uh, you know post-secondary school um yeah and yeah and i feel like we could learn a lot from other countries uh in many ways and Definitely, definitely in other factors of, you know, running a country as well. The, yeah. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts? I find that I find that thought really interesting, sure. actually. Um, I, I kind of want to look for a study and see if anyone's looked at whether or not there's a relationship between tuition fees mm-hmm. and, like, uh, academic performance or dropout rates, and, you know? I feel like that would be really interesting to look at. I haven't seen any literature on it. But it would make what you're saying does make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't know if that's exactly how it works in the real world, you know? Because yeah. maybe, maybe, you know, with the tuition fees, you know, a lot of people have to work while they study, you know? 
and when yeah. they have to work while they study, you know, that's a lot of time you have to dedicate to working, and that takes away from mm -hmm. studying, right? So maybe if the tuition fees are too high, then obviously it might start hurting their academic performance, or maybe it gets like, uh, so maybe it gets to like the really expensive schools, and maybe if your parent pays for it, then it's like, eh, you know, because you didn't really pay for it. If you don't have to pay them back, then obviously, mm -hmm. um, that pressure won't be there, and then who knows. So I'd be really interested to look into it more, actually. That was a really interesting thought you came up with there. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, that is a very interesting thought. Yeah, and uh, continue on with, with what you're saying, Lorenzo. There are definitely a lot of different factors with mm -hmm. kind of um, your motivation Yeah. and kind of how that relates with either paying yourself with how much uh, loan you're taking on mm -hmm. and all those factors with like um, needing to work while you're studying. The other thing that I thought of while you're talking about that is how a lot of people, when they go into university, you know, they're really young. They don't really have a good idea of what they really want to do in life, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of studying whatever, and that that's okay, you know. That's kind of how it is for a lot of people because um, you're just coming out of high school, right? You're not supposed to have everything figured yeah. out. That's a big ask. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of people, I feel like when they're taking on those loans, it's harder for them to just switch into a different path um, because they've already taken on like and that um, commitment, yeah, a certain amount of loan, right? They already made a certain kind of commitment, mm -hmm. and if they choose to do something else, they have to like kind of start over to a certain degree and take on even more loans, right? So I feel like that's a factor kind of stopping people from really doing what they actually be wanting to do with their lives and with uh, what they want to be studying. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing that might be tied into this. Right? Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I guess tying it back to complacency rather than just uh, the student loan and that kind of uh, issue. Um, I, I see complacency with a, uh, kind of this the society and the government here in Canada with other issues such as the healthcare system for example mm -hmm. that's something I feel like a lot of people um, in other countries look at and be like you know it's it's really good right universal uh, health care for everyone and in that sense it mm -hmm. is absolutely but there are many like, aspects of it that we could improve and there are also certain flaws in the system that are just not addressed. And for for example, one thing I notice is that a lot of people have minor uh, health problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have little things that bother them, and they might go see a doctor, right? And then they'll be okay. Well, it's not it's not a very serious issue, so mm -hmm. we're not really gonna do anything about it for month mm -hmm. and month because we gotta spend the government resources. Um, the people who actually need it right mm -hmm. now and like it makes sense logically mm -hmm. what they're doing but you're like is there is there a way where people doesn't have to deal with all those yeah. issues for a month mm -hmm. before it's addressed right that it's just like i feel like when a lot of people in the country are dealing with that and it's just not being addressed um if it were to be like, addressed and we do fix that kind of problem I think a lot of people's lives would increase in their quality mm -hmm. a lot. Hundred percent, right? yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, other other thing with healthcare um, is from what I've been looking at before is that you know in Canada it's very difficult to become a doctor. It's a long process. It's rigorous, and there are many requirements that you need to get, that, which are difficult to um, kind of get mm -hmm. to that level right but the thing is Canada need a lot of doctors mm -hmm. like there's always a shortage they always want more people who go into the profession mm -hmm. right even as like um, obviously many specialists we need them but even like family doctors the population is growing many communities the the local clinics are just not very they just don't have that many time mm -hmm. slots to see all the patients mm -hmm. So more clinics with family doctors, that would be helpful. But like I was saying, <laughs> the process is, is very difficult, right? And maybe, maybe that's not necessarily a problem. You know, you want to get very high quality 
uh, doctors as an end product, right? Mm-hmm. But a main problem that I see in this process, I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but especially in the recent years, there are graduates from medical schools who are not finding placement for their residency. Mm-hmm. So they have to wait a whole other year to get placed for residency again. So after that difficult process, you made it through, uh, you got your MD, right? <laughs> and you don't, get, you don't get to do your residency. You don't get to actually have the hands-on experience and to actually help people. And it just doesn't make sense when, when the country obviously need more doctors. I just yeah, don't understand how that we doesn't make have any flaws sense. like that in the system. That doesn't make sense. Right? But why can't we just give them residency? Is it like... Yeah. We have too many people in residency. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, yeah, no, like, I I see what you're saying, and I agree. Um, I feel like, especially over the long process as well, and like how you were Mm -hmm. saying it, it's really complicated, and I feel like that's also a really big factor when it comes to, Mm -hmm. you know, like students trying to uh, go into that path, and I feel like it really deters a lot of potential i guess Mm -hmm. um as well and even afterwards like you were saying it's it's hard to find residents so i feel like maybe maybe if they prioritize you know um you know up and coming doctors you know i feel like that would really benefit as well as promoting uh that path as well and i feel like they Mm -hmm. do really they they do a good job you know leading you towards you know post-secondary but they don't really do a good job helping you choosing your path or um, promoting like you know certain pathways in which people might enjoy that they don't know or yeah I think they do a really poor job in that especially um, academic advising I feel like law schools could really do a better job in that as well <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just not. It, it doesn't do as well as you might think like you want to go there you know people go there for help but they they give you advice that that don't really help you but rather mm-hmm. it you know it's more of their way of thinking and they don't really see what mm-hmm. the student really wants and i feel like that's a really big issue as well especially coming from you know high school as well you're, you're not ready you know, they, they don't get you ready for post-secondary. They don't get you ready for college, university. They, they kind of just throw you out there and be like, you know what? You kind of need to do this if you want, you know, a proper life. And and I feel like a lot of people are pressured into it. Um, so I feel like guidance is another big thing, especially for the younger generations too. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a really big problem as well. Yeah, I think a lot of the education in just high school and elementary school, too, just needs to be more rigorous, honestly. Because mm-hmm. a lot of this complacency that we're talking about, you know, you don't realize it, but over the formative years of, like, high school and, like, uh, late elementary school, you know, that's where you build a lot of habits that you could carry into adulthood, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, a lot of people develop it later in life. But, you know, if you get disciplined at that age, then, you know, chances are you'll be more disciplined throughout university, right? Like, for me, I was really disciplined because, um, I don't know, I just felt like the Colombian school system just kind of pushed it out of you a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So, from, like, the couple of years that I did school in Colombia, I was, like, on the money every, t- every day that I got fr- home from school. I'd work on my uh, homework before I did anything else, and that's all I would do until I finished it. And th- that was basically how I functioned up until high school and, like, grade 8 when I'm like, okay, maybe I'd... I don't need to push myself that far to reach the goals that I want to reach right now, right? And I feel like mm-hmm. that's when that that attitude is like kind of dangerous, you know, because from there it just kind of escalates until you start procrastinating in university, and then mm-hmm. and then you know, oh, I'll watch the lecture later, you know, it's online, it's fine. Yeah. yeah so dangerous trap. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> just the the whole high school system right now is just not the greatest. It, it doesn't help at all with the complacency issue at all. And a lot of the stuff that they teach is just, um, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing, man. I don't know. Um, yeah. I also think that the education system needs to be more, I guess, countrywide. Because currently it's it's provincially 
um, determined. Yeah. And I feel like that's another big issue about it because if you're used to, let's say you move, right? You're used to a certain mm-hmm. level of education in you know one province, and then you go to another, and it's not quite the same. It kind of throws you off, and it, it like it just doesn't provide equal amount of education amongst like the whole population. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a big issue as well. It's not like you know, like a horrible you know thing, but I feel like they could really improve on that, um, rather than being more lenient in certain areas than others. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I kind of yeah. I'm... I um I see where you're coming from, and I like the idea of like standardizing stuff like math, uh, kind of science a little bit, but I do really like I I quite enjoyed a lot of the. Um, parts where we talk about like bc sort of stuff so when we talk about like the bc ecosystems and like science class and things like that all that Mm -hmm. jazz i really i really like because it's more engaging than the regular stuff right Mm -hmm. so yeah i definitely think more standardization would be good um like just across the country Mm -hmm. but um i still want to keep that sort of like local aspect to it a little bit you know with with some subjects i feel like some subjects that don't benefit at all but yeah yeah I um yeah, yeah. and oh. George, go ahead. No, I was gonna say that uh, with the school school system education system you're talking about, like you guys are making some very good points, like having more kind of going through a much similar or perhaps even the same curriculum for certain like subjects all across the country. I think that could be very you know beneficial. Um, Especially for some of like the, you know, Canada is supposed to be bilingual. <laughs> Not many people nope. actually speak French. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like the school system could do much better in that oh, sense, yeah. and especially out west, mm-hmm. right? So if we have something more standardized for that, it will definitely help. And um, what really got me thinking was what Lorenzo was saying about the it's just not very rigorous it's not very difficult like the workload just isn't that bad really and i think that you know um like lorenzo he did some school in colombia and i actually came here about the same time he did i did about a couple years of elementary school in china Mm -hmm. where um the workload was definitely a lot even even at that young Mm -hmm. age right so I feel like maybe not to that extent that, that's, that I feel like that takes away a lot of your time and kind of a lot of your creativity mm-hmm. uh, and your options to explore other other extracurricular activities and hobbies and just other interests that you might have. But I think making school just more difficult, more standardized and just upping the level uh, of kind of I don't know, just I think the level of what you're learning at mm-hmm. each grade, I think yeah. I think that, that that's very, very helpful. Yeah, I do agree with that. And um, I also agree with what Lorenzo was saying, that you kind of need, you know, like you don't want everything to be exactly the same. Um, but you do, mm-hmm. like you do want some variety in it. So like depending on where you are, you know, do you want to learn about... Um, you know the place you're living in and I, I i definitely agree with that and i also agree with uh the point george made about upping the level and i think a lot of countries um so if you compare like you know the canadian you know grade um whatever uh other countries are you know at, at the same grade they're two grades above you know or learning like three mm-hmm. grades above like things like that i feel like maybe um you know maybe changing it so you you learn a little bit more about what's you know what's to come in later years is gonna be more beneficial than waiting until you actually get there to start because i feel like that that low head start is is yeah it, it really helps especially when it comes to understanding the other subjects or new subjects as well um yeah that's that's it yeah, um, that actually brings me to another point I want to make. But before I actually get there, um, what you're saying about the head start, like really, really got me thinking. Um, 
like Lorenzo and I, we both did school in other countries, and I felt like that definitely helped us, especially mm-hmm. early on. And that reminded me of one of the stories um, or one of the statistics, statistics that I've heard of about NHL um, and basically how a lot of the, well, there are like a statistically significant amount of players that are born um, in the earlier month of the year. Like they're just mm-hmm. they're just more of them, and they look at it and they they realize at a younger age because everyone start playing at a very young age, uh, born early in the year, mm-hmm. it's gonna give you a physical advantage. You're more developed, right? Mm-hmm. So you're gonna be playing better just because you're physically more developed, and then because you're playing better, you're gonna get more playing time. You're gonna get invited to more um, like camps and tournaments, and you're gonna be able to work with better coaches and all that. And that kind of uh, things just kind of, uh, kind of um, what they just kind of stack on, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then kind of the end result is a, like, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. So, so what you're saying with a head start, I feel like that's definitely something um, that other people or students coming to Canada and getting to the Canadian education system has. And I feel like if we could somehow just allow the local Canadians growing up in this uh, education system for them to just be at the same level as kind of the rest of the world coming into mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because like, uh, like basically the point I'm trying to make is just like it does snowball, it does stack up. And you might think it's not like that, that big of a deal because at the end once you get to university it's kind of all the same level again right Mm -hmm. but like there are definitely differences so yeah Mm -hmm. uh, I think upping the level and getting students more prepared for the coming up years is a very good idea Raymond and the point that I was gonna make with what you're saying was that uh, I think Canadians overall just kind of are living in pockets Mm -hmm. like you're seeing with the school system it's like all provincial based it's a lot Mm -hmm. of time is very localized um but really i feel like one of the other problems canada has is just everyone's just living in these small pockets right um just in like maybe just a few uh (laughs) basically a few big cities and they're all fairly close to the border right so and it's because how big Canada is, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to get from one place to the other. So it I, I, it makes sense why it's like that. Yeah, it's the OG problem mm-hmm. Canada's but always had, geography. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, <laughs> and it's it crazy. remains a problem yeah. <laughs> to this day. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if we'll ever have so, like a significant yeah. population up north, you know? Like... Mm-hmm. Even just within like those lower like provinces and territories, I don't know if you'll ever see like massive big cities uh, far away from the U.S. border. To be honest, uh, maybe eventually, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think it'll probably stay mostly concentrated to the lower part of the border. I um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I feel like a lot of, um, a lot like many times. I feel like we're really influenced by the states. You know. And like what they do, um, so like, I guess Canada tries to make make like a certain way of it, or you know like change it up a little bit. But I feel like it really has a, I, don't, I wouldn't say detrimental, but like I really, I think it really has an effect on individual lifestyles and how it's affected. So when I came to Ontario from BC, I realized like. Um, like you know how bc it, it really encourages you to be you know um outdoors and be active you know because it's such a nice place there you know the geography of it is just it it allows you to do more out you know outdoors activities I mean, while in ontario it's you know it's cold it's harsh um or it's too hot you know and because we live so close to the states it it's like you know the big the big difference when i moved here was i i like a lot of the population is obese or unhealthy and the lifestyles are a lot more different than um the lifestyles in bc i feel like it it's a i think 
that comes down to just how much influence the states has um, towards you know Canadians, and because we you know like George said we're separated in pockets, that that really influences a lot of different lifestyles and like how people live in certain areas, and it might not be the best in certain areas and it might be better in others, but you don't really see any improvements or any encouragement to to you know live differently or better. Mm. So I think that's a really big problem in certain areas of Canada. And, uh, Any thoughts on that, Lawrence? Yeah, it makes sense. And a lot of those issues that you talk about there, like those harsh conditions, it only gets worse when you move up north. So I think mm-hmm. that just reinforces that point a little bit, you know. And also, like, if you just look at the geography for up north, I haven't looked into it myself in a long time, but I don't know. There's just no good reason to go build a big town anywhere there or a big city like what do you <laughs> like no. you're just further away from everything than you would be if you were at the closer to the border so i don't know mm-hmm. yeah geography is a tricky yeah. one in canada for sure mm-hmm. and i think um the other thing that this really ties into with canada i i never felt like there was a really strong national identity mm-hmm. and i feel like there i i could see two big reasons for it and one of them is you know living in these pockets and just kind of being separated it's difficult to travel between these cities where you you basically have to take flights or really long and expensive train rides Mm -hmm. or you have to drive for hours and hours and hours right Mm -hmm. so there's no easy way to do it Uh, so i think that's that's one one reason for it and the other reason is how uh multicultural canada is Mm -hmm. and that is such a great thing for canada Mm -hmm. because i definitely feel like you know people are very tolerant people uh have a lot more exposure to other cultures in terms of food and just in terms of like the holidays and just kind of traditions other cultures have and just just being exposed to it but it it feels like people aren't really kind of um crossing into the other culture Mm -hmm. uh to any depth at all it feels like people are kind of staying um in their own little groups Mm -hmm. so not only are we living in pockets within those pockets we're grouping ourselves into even smaller Mm -hmm. smaller pockets Mm -hmm. right so these very small communities with people who are just very similar to you so overall it it really doesn't feel like there's much of a national identity like the only thing i can really feel is that canadians are you know tolerant decent people who probably likes hockey You know, that's, that's, that's mm-hmm. as much as I really feel yeah. uh, about the Canadian identity. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I I agree a lot on that. Because um, you, you do see all these diverse and multicultural groups, you know, um, they tend to stick together, to stick to their mm-hmm. culture and stick into, like, large groups of them or populations of it in certain areas, like these little pockets uh, George is mentioning. And you could see that in um you know ontario and like bc where bc majority is just asians and they tend to you know stick together or like the chinese population um and they don't really extend out to other groups of cultures to to learn or you know to become more familiar and friendly with them um and like in ontario you could you could see a vast majority of um i guess uh, white folks you know like white people <laughs> and like they tend to stick you know towards you know other other white people as well or um their race you know and i think i think canada can do a lot better in encouraging you know um, less separation and more more of a diverse community all together and I know Canada have tried. There's a lot of programs that used to happen, but not anymore. I don't see as much now. I think Canada's just accepted, you know, a certain degree of, um, uh, I guess, integr- I don't know. Like, they, they've <laughs> accepted a certain degree of um, how people, I guess, interact with each other or different races and different cultures. And they kind of stopped encouraging more you know togetherness and um yeah yeah i mean i feel to some extent it's pretty natural you know i think humans just like to be in groups 
together with other people. So I think they'll naturally mm -hmm. gravitate toward making those groups. And uh, I think, I don't know, it's just pretty natural that a lot of it, a lot of times it just happens by race, you know? Like in high school, for yeah, example, you'd for always sure. have the, um, the, the man, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, you got those yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah you got that, those guys. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But a lot of the people from like the Punjab area, they would always hang out together, you know. Oh man, the samosa sales sometimes. Oh my God. Oh. Don't even get me started. That was so good. Uh, yeah. But I remember I, this actually kind of ties back into complacency a little bit. Because I remember when I first moved to Richmond from Columbia, uh, I didn't know much English at all, right? I was, uh, I, I think they had only just started teaching us English in school when I left Columbia. So I knew a handful of words and that was it. I knew like cat and dog and that was, that's, that's all I could remember, right? Wow. So we moved to Richmond, which is, I think, probably still um, the most Asian city per capita. I think it's something like 70% of people. Well, I mean, per capita doesn't make any sense because that'd be Asian per, you guys know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most Asian cities by population, like 70% of the population is Asian. Um, outside of asia outside of asia that's true <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> just in north america i think um but i went there i didn't know english so they put me in esl and you know being in esl in richmond means you're gonna be esl is basically english as a second language it's a program to teach kids english if you didn't know but uh if you're in esl in richmond that means you know there's gonna be some uh asian students there with you right and they're great i love them but i noticed that a lot of times they like you know during recess or whatever they would just talk to each other in chinese all the time mm -hmm. and what happened was my english improved way faster than theirs because i was just forced to use english because nobody else spoke spanish at the school right so mm -hmm. i couldn't group up with anybody and talk to them like that um so i had i just had to get good at english really fast to talk to the other kids whereas even until we graduated there were some kids that were making some some, you know, some significant grammar errors that, you know, you just try to fix early on. But uh, they just got really complacent with it, you know. They grouped up. They only spoke English when they absolutely had to. And, you know, they their English definitely suffered because of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think... That's a very good point. I think a lot of this just comes down to human nature. Because I think it's it's pretty natural to be complacent to a certain extent, you know. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. A lot of these issues, too, that we were talking about earlier with the economics and, like, uh, especially like the medical field, I think, it's probably going to remain, at least, it, it might seem like it's complacent to us for a while, but I'm sure right now during the COVID pandemic, um, it must be very difficult for the government because the economics are so strained to improve in all these areas, too. Like, you, you just got to throw money at it to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult now with the massive de deficit we have. So... This almost reminds me a little bit of like um, last week's episode when we talked about like goals and whatnot and how you could break it down into like more manageable steps. That's that's kind of how I'm viewing it a little bit. Um, kind of switching back to the medical topic, topic, at least you know. Obviously, we don't have the greatest uh, healthcare in the world, but it is pretty good. But until the economics uh, or the yeah, Canadian economy recovers a little bit more. I think we'll probably just have to take baby steps towards like a more idealized version of it. Uh, same thing with like the school system, you know, you can't just reform all, of, you know, standardized school throughout all at once, you know, I think it'll have to be like baby steps, like one yeah. program at a time, like, okay, standardized math first or whatever, all that jazz. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. A lot of those issues I feel will definitely just get solved with enough time, but it'll just take time, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you definitely make some very good points. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on when you're talking about the you know high school and elementary school and your experience, mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to kind of bring up is how we definitely see all the positive aspects of having all these cultures here with the samosa sales, <laughs> with people from your culture being able to um, have a sense of community, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you also mentioned some of the negatives, which is, you know, not improving, not improving your English nearly, uh, as quickly or as well, and not being able to, uh, integrate into society in that sense, mm -hmm. and also not really, um, 
exploring what other people's lives are like people from other culture so i think there's definitely like positives and negatives with that but really one thing um i think um is a problem potentially uh with that is that we definitely need to bring up one of the other biggest problem in canada and that is they're just very small population yeah for the size of the country i was right? thinking about the, that as well the actual We're basically mass, california right? yeah. so Tokyo has so, a bigger population than us. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of sad. Yeah. 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 One city. So so for a lot of a lot of these problems to be solved, we definitely just need more yeah. people and need uh, more money. Um but really if uh we have more immigrants and they all come here and most of them continue this of just kind of staying together with um their own uh cultural communities and you know and not develop uh if canada doesn't develop a stronger national identity i feel like long term it's gonna really uh, stunt the growth of the country and really have um potential consequences you know because we definitely need more people mm-hmm. right but if people coming in doesn't really feel like canadians i feel like you know that that's probably not a good thing for the country yeah it's weird because yeah. you always hear of canada as like a cultural melting pot but it, it's kind of more like a weird cultural Tetris game, you know? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Just like Yeah, that, that's very good. Interesting, yeah. There's not much, like, intermingling. Like, the integration isn't 100% there, you know? Like, the these new, like, these uh, other cultures that aren't considered, like, Canadian, per se, they're not uh, being integrated into the Canadian culture, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe, I mean, they are, but not to, like, the same extent that you might... Uh, expect or want you know yeah yeah um and yeah you could see see it happen with um you know uh so like in ontario like brampton it's a really uh, heavily like you know uh, middle eastern um set type uh city and majority of you know the people who live there are you know quote unquote brown and i feel like it's just it's just been such a long issue and it, it's gonna take more time to actually you know you, there's not a quick fix for it um because it's already so established you know like richmond there's already such a large population mm-hmm. of, like asians and it's kind of hard to to improve on that you know so like i don't know i i feel like canada really needs a more long-term goal or mm-hmm. long-term investments in these issues rather than um i guess hot fixes like what they've been doing with like covid you know like quick lockdowns oh cases are going up quick fix lockdowns but they don't really plan ahead of that and they just keep doing the same thing over and over again and that really that really gets stale i feel like a lot of people really complain and like have issues with it so that really just kind of leads to how i guess the government's like handling all these issues whether it be social issues economic issues or you know just worldwide you know pandemic yeah. or health issues as well yeah. so and and i don't understand that it's very difficult to tackle these mm-hmm. issues especially with what we're saying how these um these cities brampton and richmond have such a long history uh and such so well established within those cultural groups mm-hmm. right and obviously you don't want to just break that mm-hmm. up because you love having people who feel um the sense of community mm-hmm. who have a place where they feel like it's mm-hmm. home and a place where they have they get to keep their culture you don't want you don't want to yeah get no rid of it's just culture, we don't have a right? canadian yeah. culture what, what you, yeah 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 like what you what you want is for people to feel like they're canadian and not like you know a chinese person living in canada yeah. which a lot of people in richmond probably feels mm-hmm. like you know they probably you know they wouldn't say that like they're canadian they'll say they're canadian chinese or they're chinese canadian and probably a very similar kind of thing happening with uh brampton and other uh cities and just communities like that mm-hmm. you definitely want to keep the culture but you also want people to uh interact with people of other culture more and develop more uh a sense of community 
with people of other cultures mm-hmm. and kind of grow that sense into more of a Canadian identity. I feel like that's what what the idea would be, but it, it'll be very difficult yeah. to kind of set up step yeah. by step, kind of mm-hmm. very right, challenging to actually tackle it. Yeah, I think that's right on the money, George. That's perfect explanation yeah. for it. I think. Yeah. yeah. So, are there any other big issues you think? Um, this is not the big issue, but uh, just, this just whole question, you know, this reminds me of that one time at the bus stop with Raimondo. Remember that? Uh, Man, remember classic, Raimondo, yeah. classic. <laughs> Man, I don't know. Should we share that story? I think it's pretty funny. I think it's pretty yeah, good. Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, we have some time left. I feel like maybe we do this because it's an interesting story instead of our ending segment about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, like this this is probably a good way to yeah i mean it. yeah my weeks are usually yeah. looking pretty much the same as always so that highlights <laughs> part would have been pretty much the same yeah i know so one day me and george <laughs> were coming home from uh, the richmond night market uh which is this you know they just got some cool food over there basically i don't know if they have night mar- night markets in other places because i don't know the richmond night market is the first i've heard of them but um, we were coming home. And we were at a bus stop. Mostly Asian. Mostly Asian. Mostly well, actually, Asian. no, wait. We were coming back from Vancouver, right? Because we were on the subway. I think we were coming back from Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, because it was earlier. Yeah, the day. yeah, it yeah. It wasn't that late. late. Yeah, yeah, we were coming back from Vancouver. So if, if people don't know, um, uh, we were living in um, the White Rock, South Surrey area. And basically from Vancouver, you would take the SkyTrain to Richmond. And then you would take a bus. So, yeah, we were coming back from Vancouver. We got off the Sky Train. Oh, well, actually, it's we on the, the Sky Train that we first encountered him. Remember, yeah. Oh, yeah, we yeah, saw we him saw there, him there, but we, we didn't, didn't interact. interact with him. I we saw him. Interact. And the reason why you noticed this guy is Raimondo, guys. Super nice guy. Shout out Raimondo. Uh, he has a very particular look. He's, he's wearing those, like, um, super reflective Oakley sunglasses, you know, when they're just basically mirrors on his face, but he's wearing them inside the subway where it's not particularly bright. Uh, and he had the zebra bandana on. This dude was jacked. Was he wearing was, was his shirt open? I, I can't remember. I, I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I almost think he was wearing like genie pants. So, yeah, yeah. He had a weird like look that. about yeah, him. Yeah. He had a weird look about him, I gotta say. Yeah. Interesting vibe. If you guys want to search up this guy, you could look up um, "Save the Last Dance for Me." Uh, he he did something. Oh video yeah, Buble, like Michael Buble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was the. Yeah. He's in that music video. Yeah. So so one of those music videos, I think it's "Save the Last Dance for Me." Might be a. Different I think so. Song, that sounds really familiar, but, and I don't listen yeah. to Michael Buble too often. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I got a weird look about him. I remember thinking, I'm like, yo, if I've seen somebody who's in the Yakuza is this dude <laughs> he just like i don't know man it's just weird vibe about him and he was on the phone talking like super serious i don't know it was weird but we hop out of the sky train we're waiting and uh lo and behold he goes he goes in line like right behind us and i'm like oh well great right this dude behind us this is weird right um and then he asked me for the time I, and i'm like i don't i don't want to talk to this dude i'm gonna lie to him i'm like ah my phone's out of battery Right, so he asked George, and then George replies to him. And then, I forget, I think you and him started talking about the Chinese New Year or something, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. forgot that part. Yeah, actually. yeah, and then, because I get, I mean, yeah. he met, yeah. you know, George looks pretty Chinese, so I'm sure Raimondo just kind of knew, hey, he's Chinese, he must know about the Chinese New Year coming up, right? So they talk about that, I forget what they talked about. But then he hits us with this question. He hits, he hits us with like, yo, what are the biggest issues facing the world today? Right? Like super philosophical. Just We met this dude like two minutes ago or less. <laughs> and he's asking us this, right? By the way, we should definitely talk about that on a different 100%. Episode. That would be something to interesting. Yeah, that would be, yeah. That really would be. And I, I remember we were talking about like a bunch of stuff like, I don't know. I, I think I mentioned like, oh, it's a good read or... Or something like that and uh, I don't know do you remember what you mentioned George uh, I'm not really sure what I mentioned hmm. and then yeah and then we just talked for like an hour on the bus about um, about just like the issues with like the world today I guess but with this random dude this Raimondo guy 
did, did he say that he thinks the biggest problem is loan? Uh, it might be. You know, that's real sad coming to think about it because uh, when, one thing that you'll know about Raimondo if you've perused his social media is that he lost his uh, companion. He lost his parrot ages ago. Yeah. He has this parrot. Yeah. He calls him Baby Picasso. Um, yeah. And apparently, I guess he must have flown away or something because he lost them. And ever since then, in all his social media posts, for years, for years afterwards, yeah. always shouting out Baby Picasso. So sad, so lonely. Yeah. But yeah. Interesting guy. I mean, <laughs> you could do a whole episode guy. just honestly, on him, honestly. <laughs> Public transit, though, overall. EDC, yeah. That, that just, that's just very like, interesting. Remember same bus stop. Like, you better have a good lawyer. Oh, oh, my God. How did that even happen again? <laughs> Uh, oh, we were just chatting on the bus. Think, yeah, the same same bus stop. We're taking the same. Yeah, same bus. bus the three fifty one. <laughs> the three fifty one was where everything goes down. Yeah. yeah, we we were just chatting normally, and some dude in the seat in front of us, I guess, could just could not stand it. He couldn't stand it. Did he tell us to quiet down or anything beforehand? I forget. I, yeah, but he he was he said it was aggressive. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> I didn't like it. I didn't yeah. like it. But we weren't talking like super loud. It was very reasonable. And, you know, I think yeah. he mentioned to us, oh, could you guys keep it down or something? Like, oh, yeah, sorry, sir. You know, I guess we we probably did make an effort to talk wider if we did. Uh, if he did do that. But then out of nowhere, we, we keep talking for a little bit. This guy, I don't know where he does a 180, right? He's sitting in front of us. You better have a good lawyer. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're going to sue me for talking on the bus? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh but, yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure dude had issues yeah. though because like he, he said something he said something else to like some lady on the bus afterwards like I think I don't know if he saw somebody littering outside or something or something but he said the same thing to somebody else like, you better have a good lawyer you could go to jail for that and then I'm like okay this dude's off his rockers this, this, this dude's not um Definitely very strong views on how society. Oh should yeah, be. oh yeah. <laughs> he wants it a very particular way. If you don't behave the way he sued. wants you to, woo, you better have a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> or the one Russian dude. I think this was also the bus stop for the three fifty one dude. <laughs> this dude, he's like, hey, yeah, man. he had this thick Russian accent. Did he have liquor in his hands or something? No, I'm just making that up, right? I, oh, no. he, he was probably drunk. Know. Let's be let's be honest here, though. Yeah, he, he, he definitely felt like he was. Yeah. But he's like, hey, come here, and he had this thick Russian accent. I'm not even gonna try to replicate it. He, is, uh, I'm gonna teach you guys how to how to do a Russian salute. But imagine this in a Russian accent this whole time, and he takes us. Th- and this is actually like pretty late during the night. Oh this yeah, is this is late. This is late. Yeah. So yeah. late at night, random Russian guy, he asks us, hey. You guys want to learn how to do a Russian salute? And I'm like, I right, sure. And he teaches like, okay, you gotta extend your hand, bring it up just like this. I forget how to do it exactly, but that was another weird encounter. Another weird yeah. encounter. I uh, you weren't there for this one, George. The same bus, three fifty one. Okay. Three fifty one. Okay. This guy, he was. We hop on. I'm there with my friend Alex. And this middle-aged gentleman sits down on the bus across from us, right? Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary until he pulls out a stereo and starts mm-hmm. blasting Queen or something in the middle of the bus. Like, okay, you're just going to start blasting your stereo on the bus? Very strange. Long story short, something happened. We ended up talking to him because I think Alex said something to him. And this guy is probably the weirdest guy i've met on the bus okay it turns out his son went to the same high school we went to semiamu and there was this other girl there this middle-aged dude this dude's like 45 beer belly and shit and he's talking about how he wants to set up this girl on the bus with his son from semiamu like super weird right and he's also talking to us about how he used to be a male stripper back in the day and he starts, he starts lucky insulting us like, "Hey, by the time I was your age, I'd already been with a hundred women." <laughs> like, hey man, you're the dude with the male pattern baldness sitting on the bus at 45 with like a big belly. Come on, homie, 
You can't, you can't lie to me like this. I think he tried to sell cigarettes. That he was, that's what he was doing. He was on his way to go sell cigarettes somewhere. We're coming back from sell, selling cigarettes on the streets or something. It was crazy. Weird guy. I think I got a video of him somewhere because he was just that weird. <laughs> but man, the male, sli the male stripper stories that guy had was just <laughs> very off-putting. Especially when he was telling it to like a uh, minor on the bus. Very off-putting. Yeah. That's basically my transit right. stories. I, I think there might yeah, be a few so more. I think... <laughs> yeah. I think that's going yeah. to be it for us this week. And if you want to experience some interesting things, perhaps take a 351. Yes, sir. <laughs> And we'll, we'll come back next week and talk about some other interesting topics. Have a good one, guys. See ya.